in this video Jordan Peterson talks about how your experiences can change the structure of your DNA. These creative illnesses are a consequence of this descent and rebirth process that we talked about before and that's much more likely to happen. You see I marked revolutionary at the top. You know, when, you, when you're a genius you blow apart the basic presuppositions of an entire culture and to the degree that your personality is predicated on those assumptions and maybe even your place in the world when you chop that over, it's like you fall too you know, and the whole idea that Darwin had that that the environment itself could modify biological forms through selection God, it's such a brilliant idea because well, because it, precisely because it accounts for why complex forms can emerge in the absence of an intelligent designer now, you know uh, no doubt there are holes in Darwinian theory you know, I don't know how many of you know this, but there's a whole new field of science that's popped up really in the 21st century called epigen epigenetics it turns out that you can, that Lamarck, who was really the, the prime um, a, what, adversary in some sense of Darwin Dar Lamarck believed you could inherit acquired characteristics right, and for a straight Darwinian, it's like, no, that doesn't happen there's lots of evidence now that you can acquire Inher that you can inherit in acquired characteristics so they've showed, for example, with rats, that if you produce a certain amount of terror-laden phobia in a rat the rat pups three generations down are still predisposed in that manner and, you know, we just scratched the surface of epigenetics it turns out that your experience can alter the structure of your DNA it does that by a process, which I don't understand, called methylation and methylation, apparently is the modification of the DNA structure by additions of little uh, clumps of, you know, little chemical units, little molecules and to some, in some way we don't get that encodes actual environmentally relevant information so, you know, that's pretty mind-boggling so, the, my point is the final word on how we evolved is not yet in, but Darwin popped up this idea that, well, you didn't need an intelligent designer it's like, uh-oh that's a big problem for a, for a world whose primary notion before then was that everything was the creation of something that was not only intelligent but benevolent so it's a little hard on people to come up with those ideas and there's no reason at all for them not to think that they're completely insane when it first happens because they think something that's really deep and revolutionary that no one else thinks or has thought up and so the probability that you've done that, instead of just going stark raving mad, is like zero, right? So, for every actual genius, there must be 10,000 people who are convinced in some bizarre, manic, paranoid manner that they are genius, and they're not So, it's rough Freud was also one of the first people to really go after the idea that we could represent ideas in symbolic form in a manner that was in fact representational but that we ourselves didn't understand and I mean that's a that's another revolutionary idea, right? is that we could express that it was possible to express concepts especially those that were associated with emotion and motivation using non-linguistic representations that needed to be deciphered now Freud's initial theory about that was that the reason that happened was because and this is where I think he got something seriously wrong, but whatever, like, you know you have to say that with respect Freud appeared to think of memory in a way that we wouldn't think of memory anymore like, he, he seemed to think something like when you made a, when you experienced an event the event was as if you experienced it that, that was the event, so you, what you experienced was the reality of the event and then sometimes you didn't like the implication of that event or perhaps you couldn't understand it, but you could understand it enough to know that it was horrible so that would be a traumatic event and then you just shove that sucker down into the depths of your being where, where, where you didn't have to think about it anymore and then it would poke itself up into the nether regions of your consciousness partly in dreams Partly, and interestingly enough, in slips of the tongue You know, we still call those Freudian slips And I'll tell you, one of the things that's really cool about doing dream analysis and psychotherapy is that People make slips of the tum tongue all the time Tum, eh? Slips of the tum 
Yeah, well, I won't interpret that for now. But if you listen to people make Freudian slips while they're talking to you about their dreams, they're often telling you exactly what the dream means. And it's so cool. I've seen people, you know how words can have two meanings, right? Or sometimes three meanings. Sometimes when someone is telling you about the, their dream, they'll use a sentence to describe part of the dream that simultaneously accounts for the other part of the dream without them even no, noticing. And then all I'll do, because we're trying to puzzle out the dream, is I'll tell them back what they just said. And they'll go, you know, they'll have a little startle. It's like, oh, yeah, that's obviously what that means. And how in the world people are smart enough to do that on the fly is beyond me. You know, it's like it's hard enough to talk about one thing at a time. But to manage to talk about two things with the same sentence in a coherent way, it's like, way to go, brain. And I think what's happening is we kind of know that, you know, the left hemisphere, roughly speaking, is a linguistic hemisphere, right? But there's a corresponding area in the right hemisphere that's more or less in the same physiological location that this part inhibits. Tonically, it's, it inhibits it all the time, and it kind of seems that what happens is now and then that other part of the brain can get access to speech. Now, it's not very linguistic, so it sort of stumbles around and maybe it does it in more symbolic terms because it thinks imagistically. But now and then it's got something to say, and then, poof, both of them are talking at the same time, and that is the coolest thing. Like, the problem is, it's very, I can't tell you about it, you know, because, and this is one of the problems with psychoanalytic phenomena, is that you can't really understand them in the absence of the context that a lengthy therapeutic interaction provides, you know, it's like, you know how if it is if you have an old friend, it's like you, you can just say the number of a joke, you know, it's like, that's joke 42, and they'll laugh because they know the joke. You know, you have this shared history that enables you to make reference to things just using fragments. And you can't explain how you do that to someone else. Well, the same thing happens in therapy. It's like you've talked to this person for endless hours about the most important things that are going on in their life, and then there'll be communication, communicative phenomena that emerge within that context. And you know, they strike you with the force of revelation, but you can't communicate them to anyone else because you can't conjure up the entire context, which is partly why I want to show you this movie on Tuesday, because... It's the only thing I've ever seen that actually manages to do this. It's, it shows Freudian psychopathology because it gives you enough contextual information to actually infer it. So, 